Republika. <laughs> Great to be here. We can make the world a better place, and I think the internet is one of the most powerful tools for this. And the next track is exactly about that. Please welcome Christoph Bayer from the German Agency for International Corporations. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I know it's hard so early in the morning, but I'm very happy about everybody who is here or who is following us uh, at the screens at home or somewhere else. Um, we would like to talk today about open source, open data, openness in general. We, as GI said, we are working hard in trying to improve the life of so many people all over the world. And we are more and more trying to use digital solutions to do this, um, be it in our service delivery for the people or be it in organizing ourselves uh, in headquarters and in our uh, so many decentralized locations. Uh, this is all very fine and we did some good progress, but the issue of uh, openness and how to, uh, how to deal with open data, open source, is still a challenge for us. It's still an open question. And we are here, of course, to learn from uh, the ladies you will see in, in a few minutes here at the stage, because they know very well how to deal with the issue. They have good examples. We have also some good examples, but we are not yet sure um, how to use the principle, you know, the principle for digital development, principle six is about openness and how to use this and translate this in a policy for us and uh, how to really deal with the challenge of openness and the chances of openness. This is what we would like to do uh, this morning together with you. And that's why I'm very happy to have you here and I'm really curious and looking forward to the discussion we have. Thank you very much again. perfect place to listen to speakers who changed a lot, who changed old structures, who broke up with old power structures. And now we have two great examples brought to you by Nena Wakama, Manuela Yamada and uh, Carolyn Flory will be the moderation moderator for the next panel um, about bringing free internet to everybody and making materials open source. Please welcome Nena Wakama, Manuela Yamada and Carolyn Flory. Hello. Excellent. Good morning, everyone. My name is Carolyn Flory, and really excited to be moderating um, this panel. And so the way that we're going to run the next hour or so is to, I'll do a, an introduction to my esteemed colleagues here on the stage and then give you a bit of background about why this panel was put together in the first place um, and then go into a bit of question and answer, uh, questions, sort of a fireside chat between the three of us and then open it up to questions for all of you to, to get engaged. So start thinking about some of those questions as, as they, they come along and, and we'll answer those towards the end. So first, also, just want to say that I'm really excited to 
have an all-female panel. I think this is the first time in my career that I've actually seen um, an all-female panel, so uh, very excited. Um, so first, just a bit more introduction to uh, my colleagues here. Um, to my right is Nena Nwakama, and she's the Senior Policy Manager at the World Wide Web Foundation, and the voice behind the chant, all of the people, all of the internet, all of the time. And she's one of the key advocates for open data, open government, and the open web across Africa. And one example of this is by driving forward the op Africa open data movement and the African Declaration on Internet Rights and Freedoms. She also represents the Web Foundation in the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. So, Nana, thank you. And to my left is Manuela Yamada, and she is a partner at Materia Brazil, and is one of Brazil's young change makers advocating a systemic change in politics and business towards a sustainable, open society. And she's doing so by heading the We Share Brazil chapter and by running Materia Brazil, a free open source platform that works as a library for social, environmentally responsible materials, products, and services available in Brazil. So, just to kind of kick things off, and so we're all on the same level, before we get into to the fireside chat that we'll have, I wanted to make note of what, what Christoph mentioned in terms of the principles for digital development. Um, and I realize I, I didn't introduce myself. I work with the Digital Impact Alliance, and I'm the director for Collective Impact. And one of the things that we really focus on at Dial is promoting and stewarding the principles for digital development, which you can see um, behind, behind us. And as Christoph mentioned, the sixth principle, and the one that we'll be discussing today, is around the use of open data, open standards, open source, open innovation, um, and basically a principle around openness. And the principles were created um, in 2014 by donor institutions and implementing institutions to understand how we can implement digital development programs in emerging markets in a more effective, impactful, and efficient way. And so I'm really excited to dig into one of those principles and have a really substantive conversation around how we can continue to promote um, these principles, uh, specifically the sixth one. And on the next slide, sorry, if I can. Can is there? A Maybe it's up there. And I also just wanted to give thank you so much. Um, a little bit of background in terms of the sustainable development goals. And that's something else that we're going to use as a frame for our conversation in thinking about openness and how we can achieve the sustainable development goals or the SDGs. And so I know that um, not everyone in the audience might be familiar with the sustainable development goals. So I just wanted to give a bit of background around what they are. And so one of the, the key points is that these are a follow-up to the Millennium Development Goals, which ran between 2000 and 2015 and set global targets for alleviating poverty. And over those 15 years, the, the number of people living in poverty was halved. Um, but there's still obviously a lot of work to be done with still a billion people living under a dollar and 25 cents a day. So what can we do? And the sustainable development goals are different because they're more inclusive. It was the, the largest consultative process to put together these 17 goals and there are 169 indicators uh, to measure the achievement of these goals. But they're not just for emerging markets and developing countries, they're for all countries and they're the responsibility of all countries. And it's not a mandate. It's not saying you have to do this. People are opting into it. But we want to think about it from a political, economic, social, cultural perspective. And so one of the things that we'll be discussing is how openness relates to the achievement of the SDGs. So just wanted to level set a little bit, make sure we're all on the same page as we go into our conversation. And so first I wanted to give uh, my colleagues just, you know, to kick off our, our chat. Um, just ask them to introduce themselves and tell us about the work that they're doing um, and what topics they're really passionate about. I don't know if anyone follows Nen on Twitter, but she's quite, uh, quite a firecracker, um, and I suggest that everyone does that. And if anyone was here last year to hear Manuela's um, presentation, it was equally as passionate about the work that she's doing. So I'll start with Nena to, to give us a bit of background there. Thanks, Carolyn. Hello, everyone. Uh, disclaimer, I tweet on stage. So don't feel embarrassed if I'm on this. Um, I want to say hello to those in the room and those who are following online. 
because that is the essence of being here. Uh, personally, I always introduce myself as Nenna. I come from the internet. I still do. I do three things on a daily basis. The first is to pull down walls. The second is to build bridges. And the third is to create equality. That's all I do for a living. The first thing is to pull down the walls. And I think that everyone in Berlin has a, few, a sense of what it means. And when you pull down the walls, you need to build bridges. And when you build bridges, you need to make sure that everyone has access. Um, I work with the World Wide Web Foundation, which is this foundation built around the ideals of Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who started the protocol that is used across the World Wide Web. And if you forget everything I say today, you need to remember one thing that Tim Berners-Lee says, this is for everyone. This is for everyone. So when we're talking about open source, openness in technology, openness in systems, it is because our final aim is that this will be for everyone. The SDGs have come in nicely and say, leave no one behind. So on one part, we say, leave no one behind. On the other part, we say, this is for everyone. Those two are the same ideals. So break down the walls, build the bridges, and ensure equality. Those are the ideals that the Web Foundation lives with. Before my joining the Web Foundation, I used to be part of the Free Software and Open Source Foundation for Africa. We had wonderful working sessions with what used to be INVENT in those days, that is now GIZ. We worked on business models, we worked on open source platforms, we worked on learning platforms, we worked on making Africans make a living on, through different uh, business models around technology. So openness is what makes the world go round. If you hear that we're talking about the, the web today, it is because it breaks down the walls, it is because it builds bridges, it is because its final aim is equality, equity among the people. So openness is not about software and hardware, it is about systemic ideologies of having everyone be part of a change, of having everyone benefit from that change, and of course having sustainable development. If you hear me say that our final aim should be that all of the people should be free and able to access all of the internet all of the time, it is because it is in so doing that we will eventually arrive at equality that leaves no one behind. Once again, if you forget everything that I've said today, do not forget that this is for everyone. I'll stop here. Excellent, thank you. And Manuel, the same question. Um, tell us a little bit more about yourself and, and what you're passionate about. So, uh, good morning. Thanks everyone to be following us here. Um, so what I do basically is we work with uh, open innovation and open access to information. We, uh, back in Brazil, me and the people we, I work with, uh, we seriously believe that there is a huge amount of information and all we need to do is grant that everyone can access it. Not just to make it available, but to put it in an easy language that everyone can understand. Uh, if we keep uh, writing and generating content only for experts who can, who are highly educated and can read that and translate that into their own benefit, this will not make sense. This is not the kind of knowledge we want to create. Uh, so we began uh, 10 years ago developing materials uh, that were open source. So we were creating uh, new materials that could develop into new products that were, didn't exist in the market. And back then, everyone would ask us, why don't you place a patent upon these materials? Because you are doing something no one else is doing. And we, since the beginning, we always said, uh, we don't want to make it a patent out of it, because we believe that this is public benefit. This is a common good. And if we don't understand that there is a common good, that we are all together on this, that we are part of the same society, globally speaking, it's not going to make any sense of living. You know? it, 
why are you here if you're not here to share your life with everyone else? Uh, so we started working with open innovation back when this was not heard of in Brazil, uh, which then, uh, after developing uh, several materials, it scaled up into an open platform uh, that collects materials and products that work uh, for social and environmental responsibility in the country, that are available in the country. And uh, what we understood back then was everyone wants to do good. So human beings, in, for principle, they want to do good. If they are given the choice of doing something that is good for their peers or if it's good for the planet, uh, they're going to take that chance. But most of the time they lack information because it's uh, encapsulated, you know, either on a very technical aspect or um, it's hidden. So what we wanted to do is we want to unlock information, okay? And then through this platform, we developed six uh, analysis driver, drivers uh, who look from life cycle uh, assessment up into like human conditions for workers and uh, on a very easy language so that people can self-assess their own products and consumers can go online and see. So we connect these two ends. Uh, we don't charge anything for that um, because we understand that if you start charging money, then you create a wall, you create a barrier. Um, and this is, it. this is my passion for life, is like make sure that knowledge is available and accessible for everyone, not just there, but that you can actually access and understand. Excellent, thank you. My next question is, in thinking about the SDGs that are, that are behind us, right, there are 17 of these global goals that we're trying to achieve by the year 2030. Um, and it's gonna, it's gonna be hard. There are, a lot of, um, there are a lot of targets that weren't met with the MDGs and, and thinking about how are we going to achieve those with the SDGs. And I think one of the things that this panel is positing is that openness um, is, is a way to achieve those. And so would like to, to kind of ask both of you, in thinking about openness, um, what does that mean to you? Um, and how does it apply? How can it help in the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals? So Nana would kick it over to you first. Thanks again. Um, I think most people here are adults and they were around in the year 2000 when we had the MDGs. I think one of the things that was wrong with the MDGs was because there was an idea that the, there was list, there were developed country, rich countries and poor countries. And there was a divide, okay? Uh, maybe a wall, if I should say. Some people are good and others are bad. Or some are, some are fine and others are not fine. And those who are fine should be helping those who are not fine. And I think finally we found that ideology was wrong. And the new concept around the SDGs is actually that nobody should be left behind. And these are global goals, we prefer calling them, because it is for all of us. Everyone is in it. So that's actually, on the conceptual form format, that is a beginning. Now, if you look at the goals from poverty, from education, from gender equality, to peaceful societies, you find out that the, 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 the same values of the digital principles actually apply. We are looking at um, engagement from all stakeholders. We are looking at transparency. We are looking at accountability. Um, I do recall that in the years that led up to, the, um, to what, was, what finally became the global goals, goal 16 had a lot of problems because we actually wanted it to be good governance in those days. And they're like, no way. We, it went round and round, and it came to peaceful societies. But uh, at the Web Foundation, we believe that the, the final aim of openness in technology, of openness in data, of access to information, is for us to have participation, meaningful participation. There is no way you can have meaningful participation in economic, social, cultural, or any development if you don't have openness around data, openness around systems, accountability and governance, good management of resources, you cannot have it. So without openness, we will not achieve the SDGs. It will not happen because it is not something that government will report on. We need total engagement, 
from all stakeholders. That will be my second point. My third point is something I would like to flag while we are here. It is very easy to take it for granted that things are okay. You know, the World Bank level kind of reporting with you t where you tick the boxes, that is not sustainable development. We need to look at people who have reduced mobility. We need to look at people who live in rural areas in Africa. We need to look at women. Hello? Because the, 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 um, I think over the days we've talked about machine, machine reading, artificial intelligence, and algorithms. They don't have feelings, okay? And we may be gamed we may be deceived into thinking that all is well when indeed we're actually extending the, the, the gender divide, okay? We can say, uh, what is the average? And we work with averages and we report and we fail to see that the, the lower part of the society that is poor is getting poorer. So we might want to lift a big chunk out of poverty, and then the people who are poor are actually getting poorer. And we report that all as well. That is wrong. It would be wrong to say the number of people who went to school without saying the number who actually finished school, because those are the issues. So um, in goal 17, I think the first or second paragraph, sorry, I'm speaking UN language, you will see that data is very key. So when we at the Web Foundation is talking about openness and data, we're not talking about statistics, the official thing. We're talking about data that is citizen-generated, data that comes from every one of us, that says, is that from me? Okay. Data that comes from every one of us to, to show where we are, where we are coming from, and where we are going to. And let me stop here. Thank you. And Manuela, same question, and thinking about you know, the sustainable development goals um, and how openness can be applied and thinking about the, the specific work that you're doing, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. So um, the first thing, when we talk about openness, um, I think in the end, we are talking about collaboration. Mm -hmm. I mean, how can you collaborate? How can you be open to work with others? How can you be open not just to share what you have, to share your asset, to share your thoughts, to share your information, to share your knowledge, but also to recognize that that other person also has knowledge, also has information, also has something that is valuable uh, for the community. So there is obviously uh, what we do like very traditionally that is open source. Uh, we basically open source everything uh, we design or that we create in, in our company. And then when we think about reaching the SDGs, uh, if you see the amount of money all industries and aid agencies are putting into sometimes solving the same problem. And then we kind of end up multiplying investments because we are not willing to cooperate. Because we talk a lot about cooperation. We have a lot of uh, cooperation agencies. But are we really cooperating? Couldn't we uh, be like crossing innovation? and using that, that amount of money to invest on something else. Couldn't we be looking at local solutions or um, sometimes uh, less recognized uh, agents and understand that they're bringing something to the table? This is being open. This is uh, by looking at something that is different than what you are planning, but that is as effective and recognizing that that can also be a solution. So this is one thing. Um, one thing we debated a lot last year in Brazil uh, on an event that I organized was grassroots innovation. So the topic was from tradition to transition. There is a lot we talk about in transition economics or uh, to create a transparent uh, society or to recognize um, policies. But then when you go on grassroots communities in Brazil or inside any kind of favela, which is uh, basically slums, and everyone knows that we have that in Brazil, um, they're rich in knowledge, but we, the, we are not open to recognizing that as knowledge. And I think when we do that, this sets us behind on so many levels, on, on leaving people like, behind, on trying to create new things when we, you already have a, a local solution. So for me, in the end, 
Openness is about being able to cooperate and to collaborate. Excellent. And I'd like to get into some very specific, concrete examples for the audience as well. And thinking about, you know, we have this concept of openness and open source and open open data. And what are some? I'll, I'll start with you, Manuela. What are what are some specific examples um, of of how this has happened and how it's been effective and how we could sort of use those lessons to move forward? Okay, um, I can give you two examples. One is uh, big scale, governmental level. And one is a small scale, small scale uh, innovation driven. So I don't know if everyone here knows, but a few years ago, Brazil took a very political um, decision of breaking the AIDS medication patent. Uh, back then, that was a huge movement. Uh, the government had to face a lot of uh, international <laughs> barriers or walls. Uh, but they did so because back then, uh, we have a, a, a considerable amount of people who need that kind of medication in Brazil. And being what is internationally considered a developing country, even though I don't agree with that kind of label, uh, I think we should move beyond that kind of statement, um, people wouldn't be able to afford it uh, having to pay uh, for the, the, the patents on international medication. So the government broke uh, the, those patents. And then, because of that, they were able to afford giving it for free for the population. So we now have um, anyone in Brazil, if you have AIDS, you can go to, to the, the public health center and uh, get the exam. If you prove you have it, you receive the medication for free. This ends up an epidemic. This uh, makes people live longer. This makes people live with better quality of life. So it solves so many issues. And if it, my personal belief, if is if something is for, um, it's mandatory for your life, why do you place that right into a corporate uh, place? So this would be one example. Another example I can give you is, at our company, we developed a material that was made out of um, banana tree leftovers. So in Brazil, we have a lot of banana plantations. And uh, when you take the banana out, uh, that whole chunk dies, and it, it goes to waste. We developed the material, and because we made it open source, we transferred all the technology to a collective of uh, women working on rural areas, and now they can generate their own income, which not only uh, takes people out of poverty, but also empowers women and takes them out of uh, endangered um, situations with men. Because in Brazil, we have um, a lot of uh, violence, like women's violence. So, because it needs something as ridiculous as a material, we could have a patent, but it's something that creates a much bigger common good. So, thank you. And Nana, from your work around uh, open data and open internet, what are some examples that you've seen um, uh, the application of openness and how it's been transformative? Um, last two weeks, we launched openownership.org. Open ownership.org, you would want to check it up. It's a database of companies and who owns them, who benefits from those companies. It's a very simple way for everyone to check up on who benefits from a company. I think that um, the, the acknowledgments that um, Panama Papers have received have shown us that um, something like the open beneficial registry is very important for all of us across the world. So I think you need to check that up. It is openownership.org. Um, in about one week, we'll be launching the, the, this year's edition of the Open Data Barometer. The Open Data Barometer is, um, is the study across over 80 countries of the world that establishes how openness in data is actually making impact with a lot of stories. I can't summarize all of them. So watch out for open data barometer and um, share, share the lessons, share the, the stories. I'm originally Nigerian. And if there's something that people in the media think Nigeria is known for, it is corruption. And the present government has taken um, a step into curbing corruption. 
But you know, corruption is a human issue. It's not a technology issue. When you come through this door um, at, the, at the information desk, you will see technology is the answer, but what was the question? Okay, so it's not all the time that hardware and software solves problems. Sometimes, most times, solutions come from human beings. And so the Nigerian government has understood that in matters of corruption, we cannot go it alone. And December last year, they enacted a whistleblower policy for stolen government money. And if you could give government information that they didn't have, that will help them recover finances, you could get between 2.5 and 5% of that money. Ah, you know, we are Nigerians, we love money. <laughs> has it paid off? Um, as of last month, Nigeria has recovered about $300 million in cash and in bank accounts in Nigeria. We haven't even started talking about monies that are outside of Nigeria. And these are family members, these are colleagues who will call, who will go and give that information. And that money has been recovered in Nigeria, for Nigeria, by Nigerians. What other kind of engagement are you looking for? So my point is, um, as we go forward, we need to build trust. If there is something we get from opening up data, from opening up information, from opening up governance systems, it is that we build trust between those who, who govern and those who are governed. And I think that um, if I might pause here, this is Berlin, and it is important that we notice what is going on around the world, whether it is in the US, whether it is in France, whether it is in Africa, that people are getting tired of age-old systems. We are getting tired of establishment, whatever that means. And we want openness. We don't really care whether the president communicates through Twitter or Facebook or Viber or Snapchat because he needs to communicate with the people. So if we want to be in the proprietary old age systems, we are going to be losing out on trust. We are going to be losing out on citizen engagement, we are going to be losing out on global governance issues. So the, the, the call I'm making here to everyone is for us to sit back and ask ourselves, do, how long will I last if I use a proprietary, uh, proprietary mindset? It's not lasting long anymore. The youth of today don't even send emails anymore. And these are the people we have to be dealing with going forward. So if you think that governance systems is the one where we, don't, we are not accountable to citizens, we don't let them know how we take decisions, we lock them out, in a few days you will get up and read a communique and nobody will care. So we are looking at information that speaks to people. We are looking at openness because that is the only way to build trust going forward. It's not because I'm a younger than many people, but seriously, if you are over 60, you should start thinking retirement. This world is going young, this world is going digital. There are capable young men and women who can take up leadership. And once we create openness, when we build the bridges across age, ages, we build the bridges across economic um, buoyancy between the poor and, and the, between the less rich and the rich, between the older and the younger generation, between technology and rural people, uh, between all of these social strata, then we are getting closer to our global goals. I'll stop here. I told you guys she was a firecracker, so. Um, just to kind of piggyback on that, Manuela, I would love your thoughts on, you know, taking this idea of what government can do. And, and one of the things that, you know, as we were talking about this panel, really wanted to focus on sort of what is the call to action? What are the next steps? And so I wanted to get into, you know, what do you think are some 
actions that governments can take to incentivize um, openness, to incorporate openness, open data, open information into their policies? And also, how can we incentivize civic participation? So what happens after the openness? Um, how do we get citizens involved um, and, and have their voices heard? So I think everyone knows that Brazil is going through major political changes. And um, it has a lot to do with being open and with uh, being transparent. And I think the first thing governments need to, need to do um, to foster a more open society is to lose fear of losing power. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, up until now, information still is power. So we need, I think, first thing they need to do is change the mindset, okay? We are no longer in, in the era where uh, you can concentrate that. So that would be my first call to action. Lose fear of losing power. Let it go of power. Understand that we are going into an era of decentralized power. The next big thing is going to be a bunch of small things. So take it from there. This would be one thing. The next thing, uh, at least for uh, our experience in Brazil, is uh, make decisions available for people. So two things happen in our country and in Latin America and I think probably in other countries in Africa. One is, it's really hard to go after information. They are, they are there in the internet, but if it's not easily accessible, it's as the same as if it was not there. Come on, don't lie to me. Don't make it look like something that it's not and make the population look crazy. It's not that, okay? So make decisions uh, easily accessible, easy language. Don't write on technical language. Let's abolish technical, not abolish technical content because it's still important. But why are, I, why are lawyers writing on a language that it was used two centuries ago? Why are we perpetuating that kind of stuff? Okay, this would be one thing. The next thing is open space for direct civic participation. Okay, so when we see silly examples as uh, participatory budgeting, it's very, it, it, it's very silly and it's been there for several decades, but it's still not a common practice. But what happens is when you open some kind of space for people to jump in, even if they don't jump in immediately, a few of them will. And over the years, they're going to understand that they have a voice. What we have now is a re representative crisis, okay? People no longer um, see governments are, as being their representatives. And I think the way we're doing democracy now somehow has, maybe ha it has failed, mm -hmm. okay? Because we, we, we are not being represented there anymore. So in the end is be open to listen. Don't, the people put you there, so listen to what they're saying. Okay, don't, don't hold on to that place as if it was yours, because it's not. You're just representing hundreds of thousands of others. So this would be on a more like governmental level uh, and to foster civic participation. But besides that, I think it's high time that we start debating around public policies for openness. Yep. And like for open innovation, for open source technologies, for open participation, for open education, for openness in general. Mm -hmm. And this needs to become public policies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Um, Nana, we'll give you a chance to talk about government, but also just wanted to kind of throw out um, institutions and donor institutions like GIZ, who we heard from at the top of this panel, um, you know, other bilaterals and multilaterals, what are some of the actions that they can do in thinking about the, the means that they, they fund, they support um, programs uh, around the world? Can I begin by saying I love Manuela <laughs> <laughs> for, for bringing out so clearly. Okay, I, I want to, since we are here in Berlin, there's the G20. Okay, and recently the G20 digital economy ministers have a declaration, um, and I think that is something that is golden. I, I want to say thank you to the G20 digital economy ministers for that. And I would like to clearly say that one ask I will have of the German government 
is to take this to the G20 summit and make sure that the G20 heads of state adopt this and actually follow through because we've had a lot of declarations that do not follow through. But I sincerely trust that the German government will pull this one off and I ask for it. I believe in governance. I believe in government. I, I, I do, I'm not an anarchist in any way. I have respect for constituted government and thus is very important. But what I think that um, donor organizations and co countries need to do is to follow up on what Manuela has said. We can't be funding um, governments who don't develop their countries. I mean, I, I live in Africa and I've worked in this development um, uh, environment for a long time. You can't be putting taxpayers' monies only for governments to underdevelop their own countries, especially in Africa. What we have found out is that when we have donor monies, the donor organizations watch after their money. They want open contracting standards. They want due, due, due process, but only where their money is involved. So monies that come from natural resources, money that come from taxation, they don't care. And that is where the greater corruption is. So you, you kind of find double standards. When, when dealing with development countries. And my call here will be that if we want to support sustainable development, we need to make sure that transparency in governance becomes topmost on our list. Now, that cannot be done from only the government side. We need citizens to be empowered. We need, um, like, like Manuela was saying, right to information should be extended to right to data. Um, uh, the, the, the open data barometer shows that no country in Africa has a clearly, close, completely open data set available. It does not exist. So we need to push government in that way because openness today is what we used to call democracy yesterday. Having said that, citizens need to be empowered to engage. Citizens need to be empowered to to ask questions. Citizens need to be empowered to express themselves. There is that particular saying that, say, that says, we can guarantee freedom of expression, but not freedom after expression. Um, me media rights are still being uh, closed up. Citizen spaces are still being closed up. Uh, we are using um, terrorism to, 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 to authorize gross human rights abuses, and I think that we need to look into this. But finally, um, I started with saying my name is Nena, I come from the internet. The, the, the ac access to broadband internet connection is key in taking this world out of poverty because that is the tool that breaks down the walls, that builds bridges, and that can to a level ensure equality across people, across countries. But what do we see today? We are looking at a gentle, nice, subtle corporate takeover of, on, on big data, on algorithms, on artificial intelligence. And if we are not careful, as Tim Berners-Lee was explaining in his later, uh, earlier in March, we will get to the point where people no longer own their data and they become afraid of the digital world and they will withdraw. We don't want that. So whatever it takes to put um, trust in governance, trust over the internet, trust for all of us will be great. Thank you. Um, I want to take this opportunity to open it up uh, for questions from the audience as well. I think that we have some microphones floating around here. So I saw a hand over here go up first. We have a mic coming to you, sir. In front. There is a... He's standing, sorry. And then second is up here. Yes. Hello? Hello? Yep. Yeah, working. It's on. Hello. Uh, so my name is Franz von Weizsäcker, I am from GIZ and uh, my question as an implementing, working for an implementing agency for development, we have 
many decades of experience of building bridges in the physical world and, and building infrastructure in the physical world and uh, water supply and all these things where when we build that for us it's very clear when we want to build a bridge we hire a construction company and uh, they will execute the job and then we need somebody to maintain the thing we need to, somebody to maintain the water infrastructure or other infrastructures but how about in the digital world it's the same so when you, when you support some kind of open source project or some when you support the Wikimedia Foundation or one of the big organizations like, like the um, Open Street Map or so, you pay for uh, content creation or for open source creation and, and then you want to make sure that this is sustainable. So what advice can you give us as an aid agency um, to, uh, in which cases, uh, if, if we don't want to support only those big organizations like, like Wikimedia Foundation, what advice can you give us to us uh, how to find the right partners, the right, so to speak, construction companies of the digital world to partner with in order to create a sustainable solution. Do you have maybe examples of good or bad examples, in which case it's sustainable and when it's not? Are we taking all the questions together or one after the other? Uh, let's do it. We can go ahead and answer each question okay. and then... Straight, selfish answer, fund the Web Foundation. <laughs> okay, but um, seriously, um, the, the capacity for sustainability should be part of the original plan. Like we say, if you don't, uh, if you fail to plan, then you, if you don't plan to succeed, you are planning to fail. So sustainability model should be part of any grant at all. And like I said, um, we need to step away from the big corporate and also look at what will happen in the next five, ten years. And in Africa, we have youth, and I believe that investing in the youth is a good thing. Um, how many of us come from the hub culture, the open, open hubs, um, co-working spaces, the maker fair? That is a good place to invest because these are generally young people who have a long-term view. So in as much as we respect the, the people who wear suits and have global names, I truly believe that we should also look at um, organizations that grow from the grounds up. The makers' fair spaces are one of those, in French we call them TLU. All of the, make, the hubs, the co-working spaces, the maker fair, the fabs, the labs, that is one way. Um, that is where innovation is actually coming from at the moment. Um, because you mentioned Wikipedia, how many of you remember Encarta? Good. They are very old. So if we ran Encarta the way we ran Wikipedia in those days, we would be richer as a global community today. We are talking about openness, open source, if Wikipedia is becoming a name that everyone knows, it is because there was a community, it is because everyone was allowed to, to engage and to contribute, it is because everyone could be a content creator and open street maps. So um, encouraging everyone, making a creator of everyone is what guarantees our sustainability. So let's put our money where our mouth is, younger people and women. I think uh, I have only one last remark about that, but yeah. Okay. Hello, my name is Arno Ernst from House of Research in Berlin, and I have a personal background in high tech and software. And just to balance my soul, I did development work in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, and meaning I have a clear view on technology and I would like to know how the rural aspect of technology application and the urban aspect of technology application are coming together. To put it into example, uh, yes, the access to information is very important, for instance, to study markets, to develop markets, clear. Uh, it's good to have technology which transports information like in disaster preparedness of community-based radios and stuff. 
but how about very simple technologies like a river turbine pump which transports water up from the Nile to the field where there is no energy or mm -hmm. like a rebuilding uh, very old machinery which was used in agriculture in uh, Germany for instance 100 years ago like a potato sorting machine which suddenly becomes a new product in a Smith company. So how are these two different um, economies coming together, how they are creating benefit for, for people, labor and income? Thanks. Yeah, I think maybe um, I can't say how they are coming together. Uh, I don't envision what will be the solution in the future. What I can say is um, we have some people uh, thinking and wondering about that kind of stuff. So I'll give you one example of a project that I was involved with. It was called uh, POC21. It was a hacker and maker camp um, over five weeks where we would develop uh, that kind of product um, to be open source. So 12 products were open source for like basic needs. Um, we had uh, wind turbine, uh, we had um, uh, water filter. Do you know LiveStraw, the product? So LiveStraw is an amazing solution when you think about rural areas where you don't have treatment or if you go to uh, developing countries. Uh, the only problem is it's super expensive and it can't be produced locally. And so the thing is, you have one person that came from Colombia and went through a cholera epidemic and said, this is a problem. To create LiveStraw, uh, of course, it is a solution and, and a very good one. Thank everyone for creating that. But we also need to uh, make something that's accessible uh, without aid. Mm -hmm. So, And then he developed an open source life straw that is proven to work. So you have people uh, working around that. And then we can co also connect that with uh, the question from GIZ. Uh, we need people investing on these young minds who are the ones uh, worrying about that because where is our food produced? Mm -hmm. So you need to like think globally, and you have people. Usually, people who are uh, thinking about how do how do you transform this kind of products into open source products, they also have the general overview that we need to look at the countryside uh, because they are the ones feeding us. Mm -hmm. So, and even if you go wider, um, I don't know, Europe wouldn't have banana if you didn't have banana being planted on Africa. So you need, like, even if it's, um, this is an argument we use a lot in Brazil, even if it's for selfish reasons, you need to think about others because you depend on others. Mm -hmm. So even if it's for your own good, think about that kind of stuff. So you have some people uh, working on that, um, much less than what would be ideal. Uh, but projects like uh, POC21 or open source ecology uh, can be a solution. And if we had more people funding those kinds of products, uh, I think we would create a better momentum. Right. I think our time is up. But I leave you with a final thought. Um, life on water, life on land, and the whole of the environment stuff, we haven't talked much about it. But you know what? People in the rural areas deserve to be happy. And the thing is that we are only as strong as our weakest link as a global economy. So um, our, our success can only be measured by how good the last person feels. As, as Germany, you are only as safe as Syria is because it goes both ways. So we cannot be happy in the capital and forget those um, who are unhappy in the rural areas because those are the people who will get up and vote you out of power. Those are the people who will get up and bomb you. Those are the people who will spoil who will damage what we've, we put so much money in. So we have to be that balanced. And when we're talking about equality and equity, it is very important. We can't have nicely dressed people speaking in nicely um, in guarded areas, speaking to the same people. We need to open up. And that is why we are having this discussion. This is for everyone. Excellent. I think that's a great last point for the panel. Thank you. Well,
Thank you to all of you uh, for joining us this morning. Really appreciate it and hope you took away a lot of food for thought in this discussion and really excited to start following you guys um, and your amazing work moving forward. So if you could join me in one last round of applause for our two panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nena Wakama, <laughs> Manuel Amada, and Cullen Flory. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And in a few minutes, we will continue on this stage with a session about um, collaboration when it comes to building better urban environments.
Republika. Good morning. <laughs> How can we collaborate with people and structure participation when the problem is really wicked and everyone has a different goal? We can learn this now from an architect based in London. Please welcome Husman Hack. Hi. Thank you. Hello, uh, everybody. Um, thank you for joining me today. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about designing participatory systems. Uh, and I'll be discussing about six of the projects that I've done over the last 10, 15 years. The kind of work I do um, spans quite a broad spectrum from very sort of short-term, temporary, spectacular projects to long-term, permanent infrastructural projects. And I'm going to try with those six projects to go from one end to the other. Um, and I'm going to be talking about um, you know, what, what I'm hoping to do next. What I specifically want to focus on, though, is a design strategy that I have been kind of formulating just over the last year or so to try and understand where these projects are going. Uh, and that is something called mutually assured construction. And I'm going to explain that um, in, in a little bit. Um, I am happy to take questions at the end of the, the talk, but actually I really like to be able to have questions in the middle of the talk as well. So if you do want to ask something or make a comment, please feel free to do so. Uh, while I'm talking. Uh, I think there's a microphone that's going around. I guess you just hold up your hand. Um, so I'm going to spend a bit of time now just talking about this idea of mutually ass assured construction. By way of reminder first, though, uh, I just want to touch on this principle of mutually assured destruction. How many people are actually familiar with this phrase? Do you mind putting up your, your hand? So it looks like only about half. Now, in the 70s and 80s, in the 1970s and 80s, this was a, a, a phrase that was very much at the forefront of culture. It was this kind of military strategy that had been adopted during the Cold War, which essentially said that if I attack you with nuclear weapons, in the time that it takes for me to attack you, you are going to attack me. And if my bombs land on your country, they will destroy it. And if yours land on my country, it will destroy me. So as soon as I launch an attack, I'm assuring my own destruction, as it were. Um, and this principle of mutually assured destruction was the one that essentially meant that there was no incentive for either side to initiate a conflict. There was plenty of incentive to keep increasing the arms, and certainly there was no incentive to disarm, but there was just no clear incentive to actually initiate a conflict. And what actually happened was that through this kind of military strategy, a strategy of conflict, um, it assured by binding together the futures of the two different parties that neither side acted negatively towards the other. Um, and so for people who grew up in the 70s and 80s, I think that this was um, certainly at the forefront of, um, uh, 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 at least when you think about um, the, the, the sort of threat of, of nuclear warfare. Now, what I want to do is take that principle further. Um, I find it a really interesting kind of strategy because in, these, in the context where you have two antagonists, they have through basic, basically, you know, you can spend thousands of hours looking at the game theory around this, but essentially they've adopted a strategy that means that neither side uh, is harmed. I want to go further and say, well, how do you harness those same kind of contradictions and frictions in a way that actually enables you not just to remain static, but actually to be constructive together, to move forward together? And so I've been kind of exploring this idea of mutually assured construction, which is essentially a strategy where we can build and act and make decisions together without requiring consensus. It's all very easy if we have consensus, of course. If we all agree on stuff, then you know, uh, none of this really matters. But in the messy world that we live in, 
in most cases, we do not have consensus before needing to act. And that's really where the, 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 this kind of idea of mutually assured construction has emerged. Now, as a designer, my interest really is how do you structure this participation? How do you take things like frictions and contradictions and structure the participation in, an, in such a way that this sort of um, strategy emerges? If you're concerned or interested in, in participatory design, one of the, the most kind of um, uh, difficult concepts to get your head around is wait, how do you design for participation? Because part of the principle of participation should be that you kind of devolve or you decentralize um, uh, uh, the process. But if there's a designer, then that implies some kind of centralizing of decision making. And this, you know, after many sort of angst-ridden years of wondering, how do I step out of being a designer while designing participatory systems? What I realized was that actually in any system, in any anything that we create, there is always somebody who makes decisions that, that impinge on other people. But it is possible to make decisions about the things that we put in this world that open up the set of possibilities for other people to make decisions. We don't just have to sort of design to simplify, to narrow down the possibilities. We can actually design to open up the set of possibilities. And so here, I borrow from Heinz von Fürster, um, and say that actually the, the, the core principle of participatory design is increasing the number of choices that other people have. And I think that this, this conflicts a little bit with a different branch of design, which is all about you know, making things easy and simple and trying to narrow down the set of possibilities and trying to produce, as an author, the final obvious solution. In participatory projects, usually they're so complex that it becomes difficult really even to describe them with any authority because every single participant has a different story uh, for that project. So the question is, how do we actually deal with the frictions and contradictions in participatory design in order to increase the number of choices? Um, and I think that this is a fundamental thing that you have to kind of come to terms with as a designer in this kind of situation, that you are going to be making these decisions, but insofar as you can open up that process through your own decision making to have the decisions be reinterpreted, reevaluated, rescripted, reappropriated, or whatever by other people, um, that's your, uh, that's your goal in trying to, to develop a, a, um, a participatory system. So why is this important now? Um, for me, this is not just about, oh, you know, everyone should be doing this together and, you know, it's all wonderful if we do stuff and we're all very happy and all that. It's for very pragmatic reasons. The situation that we find ourselves in the world right now sees, the, sees these kind of crises in the very infrastructures that have formed our societies over the last few hundred years. Democracies are increasingly decided by those who opt out, those who don't participate, those who don't vote. They're the ones who, to a large extent, have started to determine the outcome. If you look at the environment, the kind of the, the triangle of climate change and inequality and geography that's actually going to reshape our cities and where people live and how they live in cities. This is coming right now. Down here, you can see a garage in Miami which has been flooded. Um, of course, it was all the wealthy and their sports cars uh, that got flooded, but the wealthy can move and the poor cannot. What is going to happen when in London, as you see in this top right-hand corner, this is a, a website um, called floodmap.net where you can map out what sea level uh, will have, uh, sea level rise will have as an effect on the geography. Um, how we're going to deal with essentially internal um, immigration, if you like, uh, is going to radically rescript the way that we uh, work with each other. Finance, our financial structures, everything seems reasonably stable right now, but when you look at the fact that we are at the absolute peak of global debt ever, which is essentially the equivalent of having a sort of a, 
a, an athlete pumped full of steroids and then pumping in more steroids and pumping even more in. And when you combine that with cryptocurrencies, which are essentially a sort of a, um, a, a, another form of transaction, when you combine that with massive tax evasion going on in the wealthy, and when you combine that with the fact that financial professionals are now talking about the end of fiat money, fiat money is essentially the idea that we can transact in, uh, in currencies. Financial professionals are actually talking about the fact that we may no longer be able to transact in currencies. When you combine all of these, the idea that our systems will continue to be the same in the next few decades just doesn't add up. Now, of course, there are a lot of people working on technological solutions to this. And in many cases, the principle of technologies, of such technologies, is that they should design for us. They should make decisions on our behalf. You can think of sort of uh, autonomous vehicles. You can think of smart city infrastructure like this one in Brazil. But when you add into the mix the fact that when you adopt these kinds of technology, you're also adopting the NSA having access to all your data. You're having Ashley Madison leaks of your personal data. When you add into this the fact that actually the data is used actually proactively to subvert the systems that are designed to regulate it. When you throw into this the fact that the Silicon Valley technology companies are using urban space to beta test their features and that a 15-year-old boy can hack into a telco. Um, and then the idea that it's crazy that fake news influence voting, says Zuckerberg. You realize that the, the Silicon Valley view of technology is not in any way going to be able to deal with the complexity of all the financial, the environmental, um, and the, in, um, uh, the democratic uh, complexities that, that we face uh, in, over the next few decades. We need to radically redesign the way we live together if we're going to make it through these next sort of 50 years. It's just, it's just a, a plain fact. Now, Either we can leave that to a small group of people who are developing the algorithms and systems and technologies with their own kind of uh, presumptions, their own prejudices to, to act on our behalf, or we can figure out how we're going to do this together. And I would say that the, the issues that we face are so complex that no single voice or even a small collection of voices is going to figure out how to resolve them all. So we necessarily have to act collectively in some way to shape these futures. But we can't wait until we all agree on how to do it. We need to take a step forward, even though we don't yet have consensus on, on how to act. And that is why the kind of principle of mutually assured construction, I think, is, uh, is so important to me. Um, what has kind of emerged, for me, are sort of three aspects that are key to developing a mutually assured construction system. First of all, is the idea that the design pr proposition enables people to work together even though they don't yet have consensus. Just kind of explore ways to get people actually doing stuff even though they don't yet know whether they agree on stuff. What I'm looking for here is essentially instilling a sense of agency in people that they can actually do something. It is possible to respond in some way to the, to the situations that we see um, uh, uh, coming towards us. The second is enabling people to make decisions together. Um, what we're looking for here is that people are actually involved in, in, in making a decision about the future that essentially binds them in so, with some kind of responsibility for that future. And by doing that together, they're actually essentially creating a shared responsibility for that future. I'm going to go through some of the projects to see how I've tried to, to, to probe each of these uh, in a second. And then the third is figuring out how to act together. And here, what I'm looking for is ways to enable people um, who might not normally think that they can accomplish something to actually make a change, make a difference, do something that 
uh, has some accountability that they've actually changed something about um, uh, their city, their, their neighborhood, or, or what have you. So these, are, for me, are the kind of the, the principles I've been looking at in mutually assured construction. But I really want to stress that this is not about crowdsourcing. We're not looking for the optimal solution here. This is not just about saying, okay, let's all get together and we're going to figure out how to do this. This is about saying, actually, the only way that we are going to be able to survive the next 50 years is by embracing the heterogeneity of ideas, about embracing the complexity and the messiness and the fact that there is no one solution, that there are many different ways that we're going to approach this and essentially building in to our design processes ways that we can uh, uh, um, kind of uh, f use those as, as building blocks, if you like. So I'm going to go through those three things. And in each case, I'm going to talk about two projects just to illustrate how I've tried to sort of probe different aspects of this. I can't say that necessarily all, each project answers all the questions, but each of them has been a kind of an experiment in probing the, the, the boundaries of this. So working together, collaborating without consensus. I'm going to start with uh, a project called Open Burble from 2006. And there's a little uh, um, slider down here at the bottom. I don't know whether you can see it at the front, but it basically goes from temporary cultural to permanent infrastructural. I'm going to do six projects, and they're going to go from the temporary all the way to the infrastructural um, at the end. Um, but I'm starting with Open Burble, which was this, basically it was a project that I did in Singapore. And I have to say that I wasn't really thinking that much about participatory systems at that point. Um, I, I, as, as mentioned in the introduction, I'm trained as an architect. And I was interested in the way that people design and make cities. And in this project, I was looking at how to open up the process to involve other people, ordinary citizens, in building something that would change their skyline, albeit just for a short amount of time. And essentially made this kind of modular system made of carbon fiber uh, structure with balloons and electronics. It was members of the public that assembled this. They designed how all the modules went together. They then inflated it. They controlled it. Um, and they erected basically what became an 18-story structure uh, that erupted on their skyline, albeit only for uh, one evening. The video is not very good. 2006, bit rotten and all. Um, each of those balloons, you can imagine, is about a meter wide, so it's quite a large, um, uh, a large structure. I'll move to the photos, since that might give a slightly clearer idea. The point was that this was ordinary people for perhaps the first time really feeling like they could affect and change um, uh, a structure on their skyline. Flight Path Toronto, moving towards the permanent here. Um, Flight Path Toronto was a project that I did with Natalie Jeremijenko in 2011, where I was commissioned by the city to do a project in their Nathan Phillips Square, which is their sort of central, um, uh, central uh, square in front of their city hall. And essentially, what I wanted to do was look at public transportation and how to adopt a transportation methodology where the citizens could get involved in planning out the routes, um, and most, most particularly in prototyping where the routes should be in order to rapidly reconfigure the city. Because one of the problems when you do new bus routes or new cycle lanes is they take 10 years to plan. Uh, you then bring them in, uh, you then sort of disrupt the city and sort of carving out the area. Um, uh, and then everyone or lots of people get uh, upset at the disruption, and sometimes you don't get it right. And so there is this kind of relationship between uh, the s citizens of a city and the people who make these decisions, where the people who make the decisions cannot fail, and the, and the citizens don't really have a say in, in how to, um, to configure the transportation. So what, I, what we ended up looking at here in Nathan Phillips Square was how to use zip lines as a transportation system in the city. 
Um, so it's, you know, it's thousand year, uh, thousands of years old, this technology, basically just needs gravity. Uh, it's fast, it's fun, it's emissionless. And the most important thing is that it's very quick to deploy and to prototype and try out a transportation line. And then if it's not in the right location, you can quickly redeploy somewhere else. Um, and so the idea was basically to involve uh, the local members of the public in defining and designing these different pathways and then actually trialing it uh, in person. So what we did was um, we turned it into a kind of a flying experience where you, know, you should be able to fly to work. And we created these networks uh, around Nathan Phillips Square that essentially anyone could come and, and, and try out what it was like. The idea here was that, you know, essentially it was a proposition that enabled us to, if you like, kind of build a shared memory of a possible future. People didn't necessarily need to agree that this was the right thing to do, but they could try it out and then have an opinion on where it should go or how it should go or whether it should not be there at all. Um, and so in, essentially it enabled us to kind of rapidly prototype uh, urban transportation uh, in the city and to involve members of the public in that process as well. So, Open Burble and Flight Path were for me, you know, they were about this question of getting people to work together without consensus. The second thing that I mentioned was getting people to make decisions together and building this kind of uh, shared responsibility for a collective future. So I'm going to talk about a couple of projects here that start to move down this scale towards the, the, the permanent infrastructural. Natural Fuse was essentially a plant with a power socket on it. And the amount of power available to the socket is limited by the capacity of the plant to offset its carbon footprint. The idea was basically that you could plug in your electronic items, and as the plant grew and sequestered carbon or captured carbon, it could offset the carbon footprint of your uh, electric devices. The thing is that even one plant was not enough to offset your, uh, a light that was plugged in. In order to offset the carbon footprint of a light, um, you need six plants to offset its carbon footprint. So what happened was they were networked over the internet and when you switch on your device, it wakes up and it looks out on the network to see if there's five other devices that are not currently being used to offset uh, energy consumption. And if there are, then you can borrow their carbon capturing capacity and offset against your own energy use. And in so doing, uh, the idea is that the community can retain carbon neutrality. Now, in practice, the way this worked was that there was a switch where you could be either selfish or selfless. If you were selfless, then basically when you switch it on, it looks out on the network. Let's say there's only three plants available, not six. Then you only get enough energy until you start to threaten the carbon footprint of the community. And at that point, as a fuse, it cuts off your energy. So you might only have five minutes of light, and then it'll cut you off. But of course, in a participatory system, you need to enable people to decide to be selfish, if the case may be. Somebody might actually need that light on, no matter what harm it has uh, against the carbon capturing capacity of the community, and so they would choose selfish. They might have heard somebody, uh, an intruder in their flat. In that case, you get as much energy as you need, but when and if you harm the carbon footprint of the community, it sends out a kill signal to go and kill somebody else's plant. And so it's done with a vinegar injection uh, over here. And you don't know whose plant that's going to be, um, but the point is when you make that decision, you know that you're going to have an impact on somebody else's, but you're also going to have an impact on the community's capacity uh, to distribute their carbon sequestering. In practice, what we do is we give each plant three lives, if you like. And when your plant loses a life, you get an email that basically says, this person was, uh, had to be selfish, and therefore your plant had to lose a life, and you're both CC'd on this. And that gives this opportunity for people to discuss, okay, well, why were you selfish? What actually happened there? Well, you know, well, what did you need to do? And so it's about building up 
essentially a system that encourages cooperative behavior, doesn't require it, but in the event of selfish behavior, enables people to, to, to be accountable to that question and enter into a discussion around it. Um, and so for, for me, the, the, this was a project that essentially um, prototyped uh, a way to kind of m distribute decision making, in this case on uh, the question of energy use, um, in such a way that doesn't require us all to agree right at the beginning. So it's been to different places in the world. We had a, a deployment of about 30 in New York, then some in Sydney, in Seoul, also in Spain somewhere. Um, and so uh, uh, what we do is we basically set up a shop where people can come and rent these, these plants for, for about um, three to six months or what have you. So distributing that decision making in such a way that doesn't require consensus from the beginning. The second project that I want to talk about in this, um, in this uh, section uh, is a more recent project called Cinder. Now, with Cinder, and as you can see, we're sort of sliding towards the, uh, the infrastructural there. With Cinder, we were commissioned for a school in Cambridge. Um, and it was a new building, fully kitted out with sensors and a building management system. It was a new community. Uh, and there was a group of students that were moving into this building. What we ended up creating, and this was a two-year process where we worked very closely with the incoming students, uh, what we created essentially was a, 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 a virtual cat, an augmented reality cat that lives in the school. That cat responds to the environmental conditions, to the sensors in the building, um, to the building management system, and has different behaviors, it changes colors, it does different things on different days. All of these things were designed by the students. And the important thing is that what, while you can interact with it in certain ways, um, and you'll see that it sort of gets bigger as, as different uh, uh, sensor data changes, the students are learning a little bit about the building management system and the sensor data through this cat and their interactions with it. But when the cat gets hungry, when you've interacted with it too much, it goes out on the network and hunts for food. Um, and at that point, the cat will appear on somebody's, on one student's laptop. Um, and it'll go there and it'll beg for food. The student then has a decision to make about how much food to give to the cat. And that is based on the amount of food that they have to give to the cat is based on how much solar energy has been generated today by the solar panels on the building. So they go through this kind of process of thinking about how much resource they can allocate to the cat, how much they'll have to save for later, and how much they will um, uh, work with their fellow students um, on, uh, on giving uh, food later on. Um, so these are just some, some clips from the, the, the process. It was about 20 workshops. Uh, with the students to get to get through this. I'll just let this play for a little bit. They designed Cinder, they named her. Um, when it is when it is happy, sometimes it flies into a tree. It is designs her behaviors, how she would respond to the building management system. He's clearly going to be a CEO one day, I think. So again, this was a project about figuring out how to take something quite complex, like a building packed with technology, get students involved in making some decisions about that, and essentially having something that's going to grow up with them over the next few years, because this is a new community. Uh, um, uh, it's, in an, it's in a part of Cambridge that's being uh, totally redeveloped. Um, and crucially, getting into that decision-making together, making those decisions about the resource allocation together. So we talked about working together, uh, deciding together. Finally, I just want to talk about acting together and talk and talk about two projects that have looked at this. Um, acting together, as I said before, it's about 
that sense of accomplishment, the sense that you can actually do something that does have a change. Um, and this is, this is often quite difficult because even when you have worked together and made decisions together, you don't necessarily sort of leave a trace um, on the world. Uh, but of course, it's fundamental to bringing together those other aspects. So I'm going to talk about um, something that took place in 2011 uh, in Japan. Uh, some of you might know that I founded a platform called Patch Bay, which was essentially a very early Internet of Things, generalized data platform and community um, that enabled sensors of all kinds around the world to be connected into a web infrastructure where people could use each other's data uh, in real time. What I'm going to focus on, though, is what took place in Japan following the radiation crisis after the disaster at Fukushima, which is that in the short space of time after that disaster, the Japanese community, people in general in Japan, were just so frustrated trying to find out what was going on in terms of the radiation. The local governments were issuing um, PDF reports every few days that might have a bunch of numbers in them that didn't really mean anything. But nobody really knew what was going on. They wanted to have some kind of sense of data. Um, and what we noticed in Japan was that the Patch Bay community was mobilizing to start to connect up Geiger counters and radiation monitors to publish in real time data from these sensors uh, uh, across the country. And so where there had been very little data before, suddenly there was um, uh, a whole bunch of data available from many different sources. Now, the conversation that emerged at that time, because there was a lot of discussion about this, because this was messy data to many people. There were measurements that were taken by amateurs using all sorts of different equipment that they may or may not have connected in correctly. Um, and so there was a whole kind of contingent of people saying, this data is totally pointless because it's not objectively measured, you know, it's not scientifically uh, 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 valid, you're using different units, we don't even know whether uh, it's the correct data or not. But this fundamentally misunderstood what was going on, which was that people were just trying to make sense of and have some kind of sense that they could do something in this uncertain context. Um, they weren't trying to amass a scientific, scientifically objective data set. They didn't have any interest in building um, uh, some kind of uh, data repository for uh, later analysis um, externally. They just wanted to know, is the radiation worse at the front of my house or at the back of my house? Should I move my bed from this room to this room? Would that actually be better? These were the kind of questions they were having. And the fact that this was also taking place in a public forum where people had access to data did mean that these people were engaging in all those questions about how do we make this data better? How do I make this data available in a format that you can make use of it? Oh, you're using uh, micro sieverts and I'm using nano gray? Okay, let me figure out how I can convert this. But what was really important, I think, is what started happening later as this, um, as this data set started getting uh, broader and broader, which is that people started building stuff on top of that data. Haiyan Zhang um, uh, built this thing called the Japan Geiger Maps, which for the first time took all of that data, related it to um, exposure time. Because, of course, with radiation, it's not just the, 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 the height of radiation, the amount of radiation that you're exposed to. It's also about how long you're exposed to. So if you're exposed to low radiation for a long period of time, that can also be dangerous. So she built this interface where you could map out different parts of Japan, compare it to pre-disaster radiation levels, and also look at the exposure time um, uh, in terms of its health effects. Uh, so this was one thing that took place. There were visualizations you can't quite see here, but um, uh, a way of figuring out where the peaks of radiation are right now. Uh, there was um, uh, another visualization to look at. Uh, trends of where the, the, the data was peaking. All of these are sort of created by the community. 
uh, there was a Winds of Fukushima Android app, which basically took wind data on Patch Bay, combined it with the radiation data, and predicted where the radiation would next peak, and so on and so forth. There were dozens of these things of people using the data as messy as it was, not just to build up these sort of objective maps, but actually to do stuff that enabled them to make decisions. So, for example, if you didn't have a Geiger counter, you could use um, the SMS alert app on your neighbor's uh, radiation sensor. Uh, if you didn't have a radiation sensor that could be connected into the internet, there was a form where you could just manually input those numbers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This was people actually trying to act in a context where they didn't feel like the government was sufficiently motivated to do so. And finally, voiceover. Um, voiceover is a project from last year uh, up in, uh, it's something that we worked on for a couple of years again um, in north of England in an area called East Durham. Uh, we were working in a little uh, town village actually called Peterlee and Horden, which are right next to each other. And over time, over uh, many sessions working with the local community, one of the things that emerged was this idea that um, they, they were looking to have a voice, if you like. This was former coal mining uh, territory that had been largely cut off, if you like, from the technological development that had been um, installed in some of the bigger cities. So, you know, these sort of so-called smart city projects get installed in big cities like Glasgow and Manchester, but a place like East Durham would never have any kind of uh, a technological um, intervention. Public transport had been cut off. You know, there, there used to be a train line that would go very nearby, but that had got, got removed. And so what, what started emerging, I'm kind of compressing a couple of years' worth of workshops. What started emerging during these uh, workshops was the idea of a voice, of, of connecting up different parts of the uh, di different villages, Horden and Peter Lee, uh, the young to the old, um, uh, binding together some kind of sense of community where people didn't necessarily speak with their neighbors anymore. Um, and what we started thinking about basically was how to create a radically public communication infrastructure, not one where you could have private conversations with each other, but rather one where every conversation would be completely public and where the infrastructure would be owned and managed by the local community. Now, what that meant, and most importantly, that actually the very physical manifestation of this would be necessarily um, bound in to people's ownership of it, if you see what I mean. What that meant was that if you wanted to connect up two different locations, the path that the that the um, communication would take would depend on which of the local community decided to host a fragment of that network. And the project itself could be used as an excuse to go to your neighbor and say, look, we've connected up these two streets. If you also join into this, we'll be able to get that much closer to the other end of the, the, um, the line. And so the project was partly about deploying this infrastructure. Um, it was partly about the local community actually working with their neighbors to figure out who would take the next part of this peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, and it was also partly about the question of, um, of what you do with this infrastructure. So the way it was uh, shaping up to, to manifest itself would be that at, at some location you could speak and you could you could perform or you could do whatever it is you want to do, that sound would echo and ricochet from house to house, go into the house, and you could actually follow the paths of light to see where the audio was going. And as the audio went into your living room, it would come out on a little speaker, and then it would bounce and go out and carry on down the road to the other end of the line. That was the principle. Like I said, a kind of a radically public communication infrastructure where you can see where, the, where the, the lines of communication are going. 
So the most important thing that emerged from all of this was what do you actually use it for? How do you govern this infrastructure? How do you start to make decisions about what it's used for? There were, uh, there were all sorts of things that, that emerged. The idea of using it for reminiscing and stories, bedtime stories, politics, religion, um, censorship, all these kind of discussions that people might have once they are kind of uh, connected through this. Um, this is a, just a little short bit of video to show you how, how that actually looked on an individual basis. And then, video, this video is not great, but I'm going to show you another video in a second. So here, I think you can see it sort of bouncing down and going down this road, although the light is... Um, maybe you could bring the lights down a little bit. Thanks. Chicken. Chicken pox. So kids loved it for telling jokes. Um, and so here is the radio box that you have on the inside that you can listen to this. Uh, here's a photo, just show it going down the line. I'm going to just show this video because this is actually the community that we worked with. Um, and this is just a couple of minutes. I'll let it play out. My own mind then miners work hard. Can you put the volume up a little? Coal out of that pit yard. It's plain enough to see. In fact, anyone can see that Hordens a colliery village on the northeast coast, right next to Peter Lee, and Horden is beside the sea. Yes, I, I was asked to open it. Uh, I was the first speaker seeing the poem, which I've just done for you. And um, I quite enjoyed it. I think it might have been curiosity, but they all came out to see what was going on. They were saying that they couldn't really understand it, but then when they actually saw it, and they understand when I was speaking my poem, it was sending flashes of light from one signal to another. And it was like Blackpool Illuminations had come to Horn. In this project, the process of figuring out... You don't need to see me. <laughs> ...having a voice and of public speaking and of, of, of being able to share stories and opinions somehow in public. The way the project developed was essentially to, to create almost like an excuse for people to talk with each other. To see people that I know throughout the community take on board a project of this size, some very fearful, some not wanting to record, not wanting to speak, not knowing what to say, then realising actually people were going to listen and so actually stepping up and going, do you know what, I have got something to say. And even if that was kids singing in the booths, well, if you knew those kids and you knew the big difference that made to them, to actually have that, you know, and to actually be able to sing and have it broadcast throughout the street, and you can't put a price on that and what that achieved. And they were all involved in one way or another. And this Horden, East Durham, now all has this in common. I think the community in Horden have been really supportive about voiceover, and I've been so overwhelmed with what's happened and how... So, one thing I like about this project is the fact that the video does not convey at all the final deployment, because that was really not really the important thing. The important thing was the, the process that the local community had gone through um, to, to, to get this deployed. What we discovered along the way was there were three cousins who didn't even know that they all lived near each other, um, and they discovered each other through this process, and that kind of is the, the whole point of this kind of project. I'm just going to wrap up just very briefly to say that um, uh, just about a month ago, we, we released this project um, called the In Urban Innovation Toolkit, which is trying to bring together all of these aspects of mutually assured construction. Um, it was commissioned by the Future Cities Catapult, and essentially it is a, a software platform for building this kind of shared understanding of an urban innovation project between many different partners. So focusing on it, 
on the problems, the stakeholders, the methods, the evidence, and the impact, and how all of this actually connects up. Um, because in many cases, these innovation projects are technology-led rather than led by the actual people that are, that are involved um, in the project itself. And so um, it's essentially a methodology for trying to, do, trying to work with very complex situations and making sure that you actually do have some impact, that you are able to evaluate it, that it does have something to do with the problems that you're dealing with, that the stakeholders are involved in the design of that, that, that project, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't, you know, it's, um, it's something that we, we worked with uh, six different cities around the UK to test out and make sure that it actually worked at different scales of project. Um, uh, and there's a bunch of case studies as well where you can look at projects that have been done around the world along similar lines. Essentially, again, this is a project about building a shared memory of a possible future, um, a way that, that people who don't necessarily yet agree on something can work towards uh, some aim. And with that, I will thank you and uh, ask for any questions if you like. Happy to take any questions. There's a question. Do we need a microphone or can we? Yeah, we have microphones over there. So thank you, Usman Haq. So we have plenty of time for questions and we have a Q&A with two microphones. Um, maybe a little applause for the volunteers with the microphones in here. And um, if you have questions, yeah, thank you. And if you have questions, please raise your hands and then we can see you and uh, uh, guide your microphone. Okay, um, first question comes here. Okay, hi. Um, my question is how uh, did you have, what kind of relationships did you have to establish to involve yourself um, with this kind of project? Uh, the last project in particular, voiceover? No, I mean in general, basically. I mean, because I'm really wondering how did you get to do what you're doing? Like, uh, <laughs> How did you involve yourself? How did you into this kind of participation? Because you seem to be some kind of a f design facilitator or something. Yeah, I, gu I guess, you see, I started, as I mentioned, as an architect, interested in people and their relationship to each other and uh, the, the spaces around them. Um, and so early on in, in the sort of late 90s, I was actually just working in general on interactive environments. Um, but I think that it was partly, I have to say, due to sell, uh, you know, I, I was not very confident in what I was doing. Um, and in many cases, I didn't want to make the final decision about some things, you know, about what it looked like or how it was configured or what it did or, or, or what have you. And, I, and that was probably the moment where I started kind of opening up the question of, okay, how do I, I mean, again, very pragmatic reason, you know, how do I get other people to, 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 to help figure this thing out. But then as the, the you know, as, as my practice evolved and as, you know, as I kind of